Thank you very much. I want to acknowledge two other individuals who are really important and instrumental in organizing this panel. Uh, Randall Kramer from uh, Duke University and Judy Wasserheit from the University of Washington. So they, we owe them a lot of thanks. Um, I was asked when we were putting this particular panel together to have an overarching diagram. And perhaps this diagram best illustrates why I'm not allowed to do any wiring at home. At all. <laughs> <laughs> what it was supposed to illustrate is that climate and climate change, working through weather, have an important impact on food supply, water supply, human well-being, population growth, and demographics, urbanization, land use, with all sorts of feedbacks that stream all the way back to, to climate and climate change. So hopefully what, a few of the points that I'll try to make today weave some of these things together. And, and Josh is going to uh, provide detail about sort of the interaction between food supply, specifically uh, the role that insects play on, play on that. So this is sort of the path we're going to take here, and uh, we'll get started on that particular path. Um, you've already seen this diagram, but I want to emphasize that, in a sense, we're headed towards um, what I would say is an interesting storm. I won't call it the perfect storm, but I'll call it an interesting storm, because you can look at uh, from the standpoint of going back 1 million years, going back 150,000 years, the, this, one, this bar here is about a change of 1 degree centigrade. And, and look at that, because so far the amount of, of temperature warming since we've seen from the Little Ice Age is about 0.8 to 1 degree centigrade, a relatively small amount. And yet, over a long period of time, and even at the, at the 15,000 year scale, uh, the, the ranges of, t of temperature change that the globe has seen have been much larger than that, five to six degrees centigrade. And those have resulted in really dramatic changes in both the ocean, atmosphere, and land systems. Uh, the two periods here, this is the uh, previous interglacial period. We're now in the next interglacial period. And you can see that this is a sawtooth pattern where the cold period is much longer than the warm period if you look over the long-term record. And you can also see again what uh, Dr. Evie talked about was this sort of long period over which both animal and plant domestication has occurred uh, that has been relatively stable. And we'll look at sort of the relativeness of that stability uh, in the next slide here. So this is a map over the last thousand years of temperature, approximately. Okay? Um, we'll put in here, for reference standpoint, we'll put the one centigrade bar. You notice it's much larger in this particular scale than we've seen before. Um, we, we'll also notice that during this early period here, we have the medieval optimum. Uh, just sort of to give you some reference points here, this is when the Vikings established uh, colonies on Greenland when in Iceland they were growing wheat and successfully growing wheat as an annual crop. When in the Lake District of Great Britain, uh, grapes were grown, for example. Um, and we made a transition then to the Little Ice Age, which from the standpoint of the Global Ice Age wasn't very, very, uh, very prominent or very big, but it had dramatic impact. So if you're in art history, for example, and you look at Peter Bruegel's pictures of the Netherlands, what are they doing? They're skating all the time. They're winter scenes all the time because that was a cold period. And we could actually see that in the, in the, in the glacial record. And it was also, as Dr. Eby pointed out, a, a, a period of, of famine and starvation. And we'll see when we get to population growth, it was also a period of very low population. This is where we are now. And I hate to say it, this is one of those times when you're rooting for a year, 2010, to be the warmest on record. Uh, it was certainly early tracking towards that, but it looks like it'll equal um, 1998 and 2006, which is still appreciable. It, it certainly addresses the climate deniers' uh, point that the temperature, they say, is declining. It's not declining. I want to make sure that's very important. And this is the projection. We're going in this particular direction, which if you looked at the long-term <coughs> record, it's a new, a new place that we're going. I also want to just point out, because we're looking at a convergence of temperature and its impact on food, its impact on water, 
and population on, on agriculture or our ability to feed, to feed the world. So, some lessons from the past. So, our ability to look uh, historically at paleoecological, paleoclimatological records, we get the following messages. Species responded individualistically, i.e. communities did not respond as a unit. Individual species responded. Um, there's no modern analogs to either historic or future climates. You can't take an average and say, well, Seattle's going to be three degrees warmer. I'll just go to San Diego because right now San Diego is three degrees warmer, and that's the climate of Seattle 100 years from now. Climate is packaged in extremes, in variation, uh, in precipitation temperature patterns. There will be winners and losers in this climate change, but more losers than winners. And then finally, this, and I think Dr. Eby made this point very clearly also, that an average global temperature falls apart because of both the temporal and spatial heterogeneity that occurs. Everyone knows that the Arctic uh, region is warming more than the tropic region, for example. Nights may become warmer than days. Uh, winters may become more warmer than summers, for example. Going back, so I want to emphasize water. And a lot of water is stored. It's stored in aquifers, and it's stored in snow, and it's stored in glaciers. So in a sense, you can look at a glacier like a reservoir. It's this sort of saving bucket of water. But well, we've been dipping into that bucket significantly. And we can see it. We can't see the impact that we're having on aquifers, but we can see the impact that we're having on glaciers. This is 1921. This is 2009. If we look at this, just the Swiss probably have the most detailed race record of glacial history or in, in going back to about uh, 1900. Uh, now they measure somewhere between 90 and 100 different glaciers. I'm going to give you just three, one that has a long-term record, one that has a medium term, and one that has a very short-term record. The point is that water is being stored in these things. If they're melting at accelerated rates, which means that the flows that we're seeing are being augmented. They're being augmented by this water, and they're particularly being augmented during critical times of low water, which for the Pacific Northwest, for example, is, is the period in August and, se and September. Where, in a sense, we're, we're drawing on a bank account. Okay? We're drawing on a bank account here. And this is the loss in mass. For this, just this period here, to give you some scale, in Switzerland, 25 kilometers of ice was lost. So if you measure the length of a glacier and you looked at how much was subtracted, 25 kilometers were subtracted in an in 11, in 11 year period. Okay? That's a lot of water that's being lost. I also want to emphasize sort of the temperature, using again temperatures of today and projection. We're going to use a longer term, this blue bar here is a longer term, it's about a 116 year record, or 106 year record. This is some work that David Battisti in Atmospheric Sciences is, has done here with Ross Naylor at, at Stanford. Um, and they looked at from 1900 to 2006, this is the pattern of temperature, this is for France. And then they projected it for what would the pattern look like um, in, in, in 2090, about, about 90, actually 80 years from now. Uh, and then we're looking at sort of the range. We've already talked a little bit about the range. Okay, so there's 2003. That was the extreme drought in, in, in Europe. And notice that this two deviations above that long-term 106-year record is now the average of the future. It's the average of the future. Here's the Sahel, Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay. On top of this, and I'll go through this quickly. So here's this period of low population, uh, little ice age, medieval optimum period. Now we're going up, and anyone's reading the tragedy of Commons knows that Garrett Hart goes nuts here. Um, keeps going up. Uh, here we are in 2010, we're adding about 76 million people to the globe per year, and the UN projections have us optimistically leveling off at 9.3. So we've got this convergence of temperature, climate change, and population all coming together to yield our next discussion. <coughs>